Sources for the reconstruction and understanding of diplomatic negotiation, today's uh, Congress. Uh, my paper is uh, uh, entitled Red Hat for Anton Grancic, Family Myth or Historical Fact. We, uh, I'm also going to start from uh, word, uh, and there will be uh, lots of negotiation, and the final result will be uh, a surprise. A surprise because I'm immediately going to say something about uh, why surprise. Uh, Red Hat was the most visible, most apparent, most distinctive sign of a cardinal's uh, office. Cardinals share the power with the Pope to uh, elect the Pope, uh, participate at the uh, consistorial uh, meetings which uh, elect both archbishops, bishops, and abbots. These are the major villages. And uh, they also decide on uh, the election or nomination or appointment of uh, lesser than this is called altars, chaplains, or chapters. Uh, According to the work, a short vita of Pope Vincent the Fort, uh, Sinibaldo Fieschi was Pope from 1243 to December 1255. Uh, Franciscan author, uh, Niccolò de Carbi, Nicolaus de Carbio, was Bishop of Assisi and the chaplain of Innocent IV. And Pope died in his hands. So the person is a very reliable person. He was very close to the Pope uh, all the time of his uh, pontificate. Why do I uh, talk about him? He uh, wrote a short link of Innocence the Court and said, being uh, very close to the Pope, also on the uh, council was very close to the Pope. And on uh, that council, council of Lyon, he was uh, uh, present when the Pope pronounced the same kind of regulation, regula, that the cardinals should wear a red hat as a sign of their English authors say the word, they pronounce the word. Uh, uh, as soon as the presentation is uh, back again, uh, you will see the words that uh, say exactly what the words. Talking about. 
very small word. So I'm, I'll see in three, four centuries, and I'm, I'm going to, to skip to the 15th century, 16th century. Mary Hollingworth, the author of a uh, very interesting publication, a book, uh, The Cardinal's Head, Money, Ambition, Housekeeping, and Evidence in Support, published in 2004, uh, a biography of Ippolito d'Este from Ferrara, who was uh, created cardinal in uh, 1540. So Ippolito d'Este is the uh, contemporary to Anto Brancic. Uh, she uh, uh, speaks about the dress that the cardinal in the 1540s wore, and he also said, uh, said something about the people who worked, who produced hats in Rome for various cardinals. The very interesting uh, thing that uh, she says at the end of the page, um, she said, Mosto bought three new red caps or red clothes uh, at Brancic. Uh, so, uh, Mosto was the person who was in charge of Hippolyta's uh, dresses and caps and whatever he, he wore when he was in Rome. Mosto bought three new red caps of red cloth from a hatter for Ippolito to wear under the meter when he attended papal mass. The same hatter also made Ippolito a cardinal hat <coughs> which Ippolito had received from Paul III. The hat was kept in a wooden hat box that Mosto bought from a scabbard market in Rome. It was appropriately <laughs> covered in the red leather at the cost of one, hundred, uh, one and a half. So this is what you basically first post Primo Capella Rubeos de Ceperut in Ipso Concilio Fuerat Ordinario. Then let's go to Faust and uh, Anton Brancic, the, uh, the person that I uh, have to or wanted to speak about today. Uh, I came across uh, the biography, the ecclesiastical career of. Uh, Anton Brancic some 15 years ago, uh, I started to uh, do me various meaning, uh, belonging to various dicasteries of the Roman Curia. And these are But the registers were the uh, official copy of the paper letter of nomination is uh, copied. This is the official uh, variant. Uh, then I came across, obviously, original letters of sovereigns sent to the popes, and they are contained in uh, Instrument and Shalania, Archivum Arches, and Armadia 1 18. Then there are Acta Michelani, Acta Cameraria, Acta Vice Cancellari, and the Rector of the Cathedral Concistoriale, which are very short notices on what happened on the, the consistory. Meaning, there's a date when the consistory was held. The, sometimes there's the um, place, the palace in, 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 uh, in Rome, uh, who reported on the future nominee, and what was the uh, final result. Then there's a Secretaria di Stato Germania, a documentation which uh, uh, shows the uh, apostolic nunciatur at the Imperial Court, uh, so it contains the, 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 the apostolic 
Apostolic Initiative of uh, Vienna at the Imperial Court. Strangely, it is not Vienna in this period still, although it's uh, uh, the Imperial Court in Vienna, but Germania. Vienna is going to be uh, quite important for everything uh, just a few decades later. So, Germania, nothing to do with Germania. Uh, in the same period, at the end of the 16th century, there is a dictatura in Prada, where the uh, king resides, and Vienna becomes ever uh, more important. Uh, these, um, this, this documentation contains original letters written by the uh, personal secretary of the nuncio and signed by the nuncio himself. Then there are minutes, minutes, minutes and uh, coded letters. Coded letters are not so frequent at this period, as you don't find them very frequently. Uh, and this is it. The, the correspondence goes from the Apostolic Initiative in Vienna to the Cardinal Secretary of State in Italy. For my period of uh, anti branch and uh, Faust branch, the uh, popes are Julius III and his uh, Secretary of State, Innocent de Monte, Pope Pius V and his nephew, Michele Bonelli, and the entire pontificate, Gregory XIII, the Secretary of State was Tomeo Gallo. The Nuncia, Nunzi in uh, Vienna from the 1550s to the April of 1578 are Girolamo Martinengo, Zaccaria Delfino, who was former bishop of uh, Juara before becoming uh, uh, the nuncio. And there's Melchior Abilia, who is quite frequently present in my, uh, my documentation. And then Giovanni Dolphin, who is not the relative to Zaccaria in the entire period of uh, Gregory. So let's go back to. So this is Schubert in uh, approximately 74, <coughs> and the two persons, Andrew and uh, Faust, were born here. But they obviously, as you know, made a fantastic ecclesiastical career, and this is what I concentrated on. And there's also a fantastic uh, lay career in the service of uh, Ivan Zapolya, Ferdinand, and Maximilian. Kings um, from the Habsburg dynasty. Anton Branchich on, on my left side. The portrait is made by the famous Shibnik uh, and graphic artist uh, And uh, Klaus Branchich was the person who uh, is responsible for the artwork, mainly. Uh, Branchich died in pressure on the 15th of June, 1573. Two years later, Klaus Branchich, who had been uh, who is, uh, the son of Anton's brother, Nicolil, and was almost raised and educated in various situations by his uh, uncle, just like he himself was uh, educated uh, years before by his uncles and relatives from Trump. Klaus Branchich wrote a biography of <coughs> his uncle Andrew in uh, two years later, after his uh, his uncle said, in 1575, saying in the very uh, title of his Vita. Antoni Cardinalis Okay, that's the title. Uh, then uh, on page 197 uh, 197 of this publication. Uh, I have to say that uh, the manuscript written, the autograph or the manuscript. Has never been published since 1575, 
until uh, 1798. So more than two centuries, nobody disturbed himself about uh, the article of that. It is very hard for 1798 and what that uh, year. Um, the Gruppo Post enters the museum. I believe that the Gruppo is now a books and on the royal place that she collects upon the Egyptian Asma in Anglissimo Grana and the Italian Correcti Maximiliano de la Correcti in the Correcti of the Matthews. Who is ready in the museums? January 1568 when uh, Secretary of State and Secretary of State of the and the Dominion talked about the predecessor of the Spanish Civil War. 
So the uh, the predecessor before was four. The first original letter of Monsieur Giovanni Dolpin to the Secretary of State Gali is dated 11 December 72. Only six months later, uh, Uncle Branch should die. Emperor Maximilian Paul Gregory XIII and Monsieur Dolphin and the Secretary of State. These are the uh, Italian texts that <coughs> can be found in Secretary uh, of Germania. This one is from this December 1572. For example, mi pregava che io potesse supplicare il nome suo a nostro Signore come ancora esso in conformità le scriveria che facendosi nuova promozione di cardinali volesse onorare questo prelato ancora tanto qualificato e già vecchio di 72 anni di questa dignità, and this is the dignity, uh, e che sperava che sua santità dovesse tanto più uh, degnamente uh, farle questa grazia, quanto che oltre i meriti che sono in sua signoria del uh, sia il Nuncio, sia il, anzi, il, il the, the emperor told to the Nuncio, and Nuncio obviously uh, transmitted the, uh, what he talked about with the emperor to his uh, state. 
and obviously the Secretary of State did not have uh, anything to say addressing uh, to what uh, ever. But uh, another person uh, was a very close uh, candidate uh, to one side, Atu uh, Branch. Uh, it was uh, this community of luck, it was also uh, very uh, faithful of Papabila to become. Letters reports that Munzio sent to his secretary of state. And then comes the Monte Dumont on June 5th, 73. Several days later, we went to the hospital. We went to the hospital. We went to the hospital. So in six months, of negotiations, shall we or shall we not create the underground track of the uh, of uh, the, the devil's uh, more quick, more painful, kind of. No, yes. Uh, A few, few, few days later, sono qui prelati e baroni di Ungheria chiamati per leggere un luogo tenente del re in luogo dell'arcivescovo di Ungheria, 23 luglio 73. Già uh, si pensa alla, alla elezione di un nuovo, nuovo uh, another, a new, uh, at least in the official documents, Hierarchia Catholica do not mention his name. Why not? Uh, in the first, usually, normally, in the 16th century, uh, Pope, during his first uh, cardinal creation, uh, creates cardinal, his nephew. The most, uh, the closest person who uh, has the Whatever capacity, the faith, the uh, of the pontiff to uh, work to deal with all the very uh, delicate questions that the pope has to work on during the first commands of his pontiff. Um, I mean, it is not the first archbishop of the uh, his predecessor, Peter Barda, was also very recently mentioned in the documentation of the various folks in the 40s and 50s. He never became a um, So, this is not the unique case. But that uh, unfortunately can prevent the uh, creation of a very uh, important, very authoritative, and very uh, a desire of person to go to the garden, but sometimes uh, this doesn't happen. This is what I want to say about uh, so this volume uh, which doesn't say, doesn't mention the very important fact that the person to come is leading me also to think about. Although, although there were lots of the documents which say that the person was a very, very important and very close to the Thank you very much. I think I said what I want to say. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Il cui il ruolo principale teneva eh, 
teologo Bartolomeo, Bartolomeo Spina, però siccome improvvisamente eh, accade la morte di Spina, l'edizione fu concluda da lì. Quello che in questa presentazione sarà esposto più dettagliatamente è il suo lavoro nei tre periodi del Concilio e soprattutto per quanto riguarda il terzo periodo. Nei primi anni del Concilio eh, di Trento, Medici ci stava nel, nel ruolo del teologo esperto senza diritto di voto, mentre nel secondo e terzo periodo, come vescovo, con piena potestà di votare. Teneva l'intervento eh, più volte, la prima già nel giugno del 47 a Bologna, quando interviene nella discussione sulla penitenza, purgatorio e indulgenza. In questo primo periodo le sue idee espresse sono tutta la linea della teologia ufficiale e curiale. Nel secondo periodo conciliare eh, non interviene ufficialmente quanto ci risulta dalle fonti e qui non sappiamo purtroppo molto della sua partecipazione. Quello che ha attirato la maggior attenzione furono i suoi interventi nel terzo periodo eh, e ultimo del Concilio nel 1562, e quale arrivò un anno dopo aver ricevuto l'invito personale del Papa, eh, da parte del Papa Pio IV. Tutti gli interventi del resto del Concilio nel 62 prendono una nota più severa rispetto a che negli anni precedenti. In questo, la citazione, dimostrò favorevole, si dimostrò favorevole alla politica conciliare di Ferdinando I, con la dimostrazione di giusto che l'ambiente veneto aveva esercitato sul suo pensiero. Finita la citazione. Perciò gli storici l'hanno giudicato come eh, azione schierata con gli antipurialisti spagnoli. Sicuramente aveva provocato certi disturbi sia teologici che politici, trattando certi argomenti, però osservandolo nel contesto dell'atmosfera del Concilio del 62 non era una cosa insolita. L'intera atmosfera era molto pesante, quel terzo periodo e i rapporti di Papa con i suoi legati erano molto le discussioni, oltre di essere aspre, hanno portato fino alla divisione dell'intera assemblea a due partiti e parole meno equilibrate non erano una cosa strana. Per esprimere il suo favore alla concessione del calice ai laici nella dottrina della Cristia, prende esempi che probabilmente aveva visto nella sua diocesi. Nomina numerosi ortodossi che, spinti dalle invasioni turche nei territori di Venezia e Ferdinando I, si comunichino sotto le due specie perché era loro abitudine, così, così eh, davano diversa connotazione alle posizioni cristiane. E con ragione ha indicato il Cocillo che condannarli sarebbe dannoso. Nel secondo luogo, quello che forse ha provocato i danni maggiori era il suo negare il placcio al decreto sulla messa e negando alla cena di Cristo il valore sacrificato che era automaticamente decretato l'intera assemblea. Il secondo intervento problematico in cui si mostrò favorevole all'abolizione del pagamento delle dispense in cui usa la curia romana ha preso una linea che sembrava una quasi denuncia della posizione della curia romana. Tra l'altro alla curia rimproverava una sufficiente determinazione nell'implementazione della riforma. E certo che queste parole erano sconte per i curialisti nel Consiglio dei Consiglianti, però che la riforma era una necessità urgente e che veniva, doveva venire da capo Entra e la chiaro a tutti. Al vescovo Zuminio oserò che pronunciarsi come parole meno diplomatiche. Con le sue discussioni eh, sulla riforma riguardo l'obbligo dei vescovi di residenza, il clima nel concilio diventò scocante. E qui 
che Dugno esprime la sua aperta posizione favorevole circa la natura divina del potere eh, dei Vescovi, la quale anche era contraria alla curia, alla linea curiale. Tutto questo il problema veramente rispondeva una questione che era al momento molto significante. Il Vescovi, era la domanda, ricevono i loro poteri da Dio in virtù da, allora, del rito di consacrazione o dal Papa solo in seguito dalla nomina. Secondo il Gliricic, lo Ius Divinum dei Vescovi avrebbe reso più accettabili ai protestanti i decreti conciliari e probabilmente su questo anche aveva ragione. Eh, da quel momento, da quelle discussioni riguardo lo Ius Divinum dei, eh, del potere dei Vescovi, l'intero concilio eh, cominciò a dividersi in due fazioni. La prima, favorevole allo Ius Divinum, comprendeva quasi tutti i Vescovi non italiani, però non tutti, e la seconda, per la quale l'obbligo di residenza era solo una norma ecclesiastica, questa era quasi esclusivamente italiana. Uh, L'intera atmosfera uh, diventò uh, difficile praticamente. Dopo questo suo intervento, la presenza di Vescovo Dugno a Trento diventò scomoda. Paolo Sapri raccontava questa disputa di decennio che Glirici si difese umilmente e con ragione, però pochi giorni dopo, citazione, allegando l'indisposizione, chiese licenza e lebbe e si partì il 21 del mese dicembre. dicembre Vescovo Dugno non dimostrò la rivolta, ma obbedisce a quello che è venuto pure illuminato da Roma. Partì prima per Venezia, per poi scendere a Roma. E in quel momento, dopo aver scelto a Roma, il Papa Pio IV gli affidò un incarico di santo. A Roma però continuò con i suoi interventi nel favore della riforma. Tra poco riaprirà questo tema in una delle sue prediche della presenza del Papa, i cardinali e i diversi ambasciatori, dove predicò riguardo la necessità dell'efficace e urgente riforma della Chiesa. E di nuovo con una cer certa in interperanza delle parole si rivolge al Papa, il pubblico, criticandolo, cioè praticamente criticando l'inefficienza della curia in materia di riforma che a suo avviso mette in pericolo l'intera cristianità. La conclusione è che l'incarico affidato all'arrivo a Roma del Santo Pizio non è stato un premio, può sembrare, è fatta secondo una lettera del cardinale Borromeo del 15 aprile del 63, quasi un anno dopo che Luigi eh, scende da Trento a Roma. In questa lettera il cardinale Borromeo sembra che ancora un anno dopo si sente in necessità di dare una motivazione ai padri conciliari perché hanno chiamato Luigi di scendere a Roma da Trento. Il cardinale in questa lettera spiegava che questa, allora affidato il ruolo di lavorare nel Santo Pizio, non era, non si dovrebbe praticamente intendere come un premio, ma come l'unico mezzo di impedire Lirici di prendere ancora posizione nell'assemblea conciliare con la popolazione romana. Adesso un po' in generale. Il concilio di Trento. Il concilio era un momento cruciale sia per la Chiesa Cattolica che per l'Europa moderna del Cinquecento. Sicuramente, lo sappiamo, non era esclusivamente un evento, in, eh, evento interno della Chiesa perché i suoi esiti avevano le conseguenze a lungo termine in tutti gli stati europei. Di questo i sovrani dell'epoca erano ben coscienti e non avevano l'intenzione di essere semplici spettatori. La storia del Concilio fu quindi tanto politica quanto teologica ed ecclesiastica. Il Concilio durò 18 anni, in tre diversi periodi, e si svolgeva su tre contesti diversi. 
La maggior parte delle sessioni furono svolte durante il potere dell'imperatore Carlo V, che era un vero e sincero cattolico. Era tradizionalmente ed è considerato il difensore della Chiesa e questo suo ruolo prendeva eh, molto sul serio. E gli intuiva che Trento era la chiave della stabilità politica e della pace nel risultato dell'intero spero. Però il suo programma per il concilio, che egli considerava una sua prerogativa a promuovere, era, era tuttavia quasi l'opposto di quello del pontefice. Per Carlo V, su molte questioni, la conciliazione con i luterani era ancora possibile. Lui temeva che una condanna delle idee di Lutero avrebbe sancito irrimediabilmente le divisioni. Per questo motivo cercò di trattazio, la trattazio, ritardare praticamente la trattazione delle questioni di dottrina da parte del Concilio e si risolvere prima che possibile le questioni sulla riforma della Chiesa. Durante il terzo periodo del Concilio, Ferdinando I, suo successore, fu dello stesso parere e cercò di influenzare il conto dell'Assemblea in simili eh, direzioni. I papi vivevano il timore, soprattutto verso Carlo V, per cui il potere sembrava senza più limiti. Per quanto riguarda i protestanti, il Paolo III era convinto che le loro posizioni teologiche altro non fossero che una serie di vecchie eresie sotto abiti nuovi e che per, ta- per tanto liberarsene non sarebbe stato difficile. Quando il concilio si riunì, lui aveva da tempo abbandonato qualunque speranza di una riconciliazione con i riformatori. Dal suo punto di vista, i luterani andavano condannati, un compito che il concilio poteva portare a termine in breve tempo e senza particolari difficoltà. Però la questione di riforma invece era un altro discorso che chiedeva molta più prudenza. Questa aspettava di essere lasciata in gran parte a lui stesso, specialmente dove portava la curia. Il Papa Pio IV eh, era pronto, cioè per quanto riguarda il, l'ultimo periodo del concilio, pronto per la riforma, ma in paura come questa sarà fatta. Questo è visibile guardando uh, le analisi storiche del Concilio. Aveva dei dubbi, oltre che i problemi, con i suoi legati. Se vorrei dire qualcosa, eh, tirare fuori alcuni punti sui quali si tendeva a svolgere un certo influsso sullo svolgimento del Concilio in modo diplomatico. Già prima nel, del Concilio si cercava di influenzare eh, sulla scelta della città nella quale sarà tenuto il concilio. Questo era, diciamo, un momento eh, che si doveva ben trattare. Il luogo in cui doveva essere, eh, doveva eh, avvenire il concilio, secondo l'imperatore, non doveva essere nel territorio italiano perché così eh, i riformatori non avrebbero venuto ma in un luogo neutro perché si aspettava ancora eh, la loro partecipazione. Da Roma si considerava e desiderava diversamente, così che alla fine il tempo fu una eh, scelta a metà strada. Secondo punto è la scelta eh, degli argomenti, quelli che dovevano essere elaborati e soprattutto per quanto riguarda il loro ordine. Su questo punto troviamo storicamente tante iniziative di eh, trattare prima riforma o la, la dottrina. Nel terzo luogo, influenzando sul numero dei vescovi presenti secondo gli stati dei quali provenivano. Da tenere presenti eh, che i teologi non avevano il diritto di voto. Loro si raccoglievano eh, nelle congregazioni dove in dibattito esprimevano il loro parere, eh, mentre i vescovi li ascoltavano per poi poter votare. Eh, Liricic fino a 49, non solo teologo esperto, diventa il vescovo, poteva pure eh, 
votare a cartiera potestà di voto. Oltre a questo, l'altro fatto importantissimo era dal quale Stato provenivano e quanti ne c'erano presenti. Se l'aumento dei vescovi fosse derivato da arrivi dalla Spagna, dalla Francia eh, o della Germania, sarebbe cresciuta pure la pressione per riforme più radicali. E su questo erano preoccupati sia legati pontifici che la Curia. Eh, e nell'ultimo momento, nell'ultimo punto, metterei sorveglianza sul Trento cerca queste due parti. L'imperatore aveva i suoi portavoci a Trento dei teologi e vescovi, soprattutto spagnoli, in questo uh, ultimo periodo e nei cardinali che erano riconosciuti al uh, concilio come i vescovi imperiali. Il Papa da Roma pure sorvegliava su ogni cosa. Uh, legati pontifici erano praticamente il mezzo principale uh, nel sorvegliare il lavoro uh, del concilio. Però, per esempio, a Pio IV da tempo arrivarono, oltre alle informazioni dei legati, uh, anche le notizie di vari relatori che poi davano una idea e rappresentavano la disunione e confusione uh, regnante al concilio con civili colori. Uh, L'intera atmosfera praticamente in quel 62 uh, fu pesante uh, da gestire, praticamente un giudizio uh, così che per esempio uh, sarebbe, sarebbe avvelenata situazione avvelenata dal risentimento tra due fazioni e specie tra gli spagnoli dal risentimento verso Roma e dalla convinzione che il Papa fosse contrario a una vera riforma della Chiesa. Anche se al momento dell'inizio del terzo periodo praticamente a capo di quasi tutti gli stati europei c'erano personaggi diversi rispetto ai due primi, primi due periodi conciliari, la loro posizione verso il concilio eh, era molto simile ai loro predecessori. C'era una dozzina dei vescovi più preparati ed esemplari che erano mandati da Filippo II da Spagna e che faranno nel terzo periodo l'avanguardia del concilio per via della loro speciale dedizione alla causa di una profonda riforma ecclesiastica. E si erano certi di dover cominciare da, dal capo. Dall'altro lato il Papa ci ha messo grande impegno di invitare il massimo numero possibile dei eh, prelati ed inviati, anche se per esempio è senza successo, però ha invitato sia riformatori che le chiese eh, eh, d'Oriente, eh, cioè, eh, cioè le, le ortodosse. Tra i prelati italiani una parte era inclina ad appoggiare il Papa per cui non dare l'appoggio a qualunque riforma destinata a limitare l'autorità del pontefice. Questi erano noti come zelanti. Contrappeso facevano gli spagnoli, però non esclusivamente, perché a loro si sono riuniti altri, sia francesi che tedeschi, che un gruppo di italiani, a cui, tra cui si è probabilmente, secondo gli giudizi, eh, eh, è entrato anche il nostro gruppo. In meno di un anno di lavoro il gruppo di cinque cardinali legati a pontifici si era completamente sfaldato e il concilio eh, finì in una crisi che sembrava apparentemente insolubile. E soltanto alla fine la diplomazia del cardinale Giovanni Corone con un nuovo capo dei legati pontifici riuscì alla fine a superare la crisi e portare il concilio a una conclusione del lavoro nel dicembre del 63. Qua soltanto nominerei il livello sul quale pure il suo politico ci giudicato uh, come mostrato il suo favore. Um, uh, quella sottolinea i punti di riforma dove alcuni erano considerati troppo pericolosi, diciamo, uh, guardando da parte della uh, curia romana. Però la maggioranza delle riforme del livello 
proposte, degli articoli del libero e la voluta dell'intera assemblea e poi sarà inserita anche eh, in alcuni decreti. Parlando in favore per esempio della lingua volgare che qua ha nominato nella liturgia, pensando alla sua veglia e alla scrittura gradolitica, eh, era in concordanza con il precedente eh, suo tentativo, anche se fu fallito, di fondare un seminario in lingua palaoslava per i chierici che non parlavano in latino. E per concludere, con il suo carattere iroso e polemico e troppe volte poco duttile, il vescovo Giugno aveva attirato l'attenzione dei padri al Concilio, però probabilmente questa era anche uh, la sua intenzione, perché alla fine non si parla di questa assemblea se uno uh, non vuole essere sentito. Il suo desiderio per la riforma era vissuto sia nella sua diocesi che nella, nella teologia e come teologo e come vescovo ben preparato partecipò con piena coscienza della sua responsabilità episcopale. Anche se politica aveva la sua posizione all'interno del concilio, questo non vuol dire necessariamente che si faceva l'impulso negativo. Per noi, tanto come per la Chiesa dell'epoca, importa capire che non tutti che volevano la riforma della Chiesa erano avversari della Curia romana o della Chiesa stessa. Anzi, all'interno del vertice della Chiesa romana, tra teologi, verso il eh, cardinale del periodo prima e durante il Concilio di Trento, c'erano i diversi pareri su quello che dovesse essere riformato, in quale direzione la dottrina e la riforma dovrebbero andare rispetto ai riformatori. Il bagaglio del passato della Chiesa purtroppo comportava la sua paura, la quale ha determinato la lentezza nel procedere con la riforma. Purtroppo non si sa la data precisa, nemmeno il luogo dove il Vescovo di Dio morì, non sappiamo nemmeno per il luogo della sua sepoltura, purtroppo, però ecco, lo ricordiamo almeno nei nostri studi. Grazie per la vostra attenzione. Uh, 
which is still his basic preference on dealing with Hitachi questions. He was born in Seravale, which is a very interesting place uh, in uh, Venetian plate, which is sort of meeting point between uh, Mediterranean and Alpine world. He also, uh, there is also a meeting point between the two great emperors and that point of Venetian uh, Republic, uh, the German state and the uh, Popal state. And basically he has spent his life uh, dealing in, two, in three great missions. The first one, he was engaged in the German questions, finally in Rome, and then uh, he spent his life, uh, period of his life in Zaza. This is Seravale, and this is uh, his uh, palace uh, below, uh, left. He also, uh, well, he actually built this palace thanks to his allowances. And as a child, he actually accompanied his uncle Andrea Benucci and he stayed two years in Zala. But after the Cyprus War broke out, he went to Italy, he obtained his PhD in Padova, and he engaged in the state uh, service of the secretary of Charlie Mutti, Bartolomeo di Corsia, who was named Mutti for the German and Germanic superior of. South and Germany. Well, he went to Reagan for an outdoor diet. He actually became acquainted with the German questions with all these nuances and peculiarities on um, very actually uh, tense questions about the Protestant and the Catholics uh, conflict. And finally, he uh, actually uh, joined the service of uh, Cardinal Ludovico Maduzzo, he was a very important diplomat, actually, he was in charge for, uh, for uh, uh, Initiatura Germanica. And um, in such a position, he was in charge for uh, dealing with uh, colonial and colon question. Actually, it was a question of uh, Archbishop of uh, Cologne, uh, Gerhard Pulkes, he accepted not only Protestantism, but Calvinism, which threatened to, to actually to destroy entire uh, uh, Catholic infrastructure in Germany. And then Minucho uh, went to mission in Spain. He basically, he, he persuaded uh, Spanish uh, King Philip II to intervene in Germany. Thanks to his uh, action and successful Philip's intervention, he got a job in uh, Wittelbach's court, it's Wilhelm the Fifth, and Wilhelm the Fifth sent him to Rome to advance Bavarian cases. And in Rome, he witnesses a uh, very fast, um, actually, Pontificate of the three uh, following popes, Urban the Seventh, Gregory the Fourteenth, and Innocent the Ninth, and he served in Secretaria di Stato. He was in charge of uh, Eastern Europe, including Germany and Balkans. Well, uh, in that uh, position, basically he uh, welcomed the new pope, the Clement the Eighth was faced with a great challenge in, in 1591, broke out a long Turkish war. And actually, he focused on dealing with a situation at the Croatian border. Yeah. The Croatian border. But what was the uh, Great obstacles to his effort was the Habsburg uh, Venetian issues, conflicting uh, points, then bother uh, making rapprochements between the two courts. And these are the, the five questions, meaning Dominion Maris Adriatic, four questions, Marano, which was a small city in Marano Laguna, which stayed the hands in the 16th century, Marano Laguna. A patriarchia of Aquilea. In Minucci actually wasn't able to solve these questions. 
After the fall of Bihać, he also dealt on uh, Hardwood Wittelbach rapprochement, and it was uh, not uh, so much demanding questions. The Pope Clement VIII stepped up and he demanded Ferma Concordia among uh, Christian allies. And actually, the Pope diplomacy was focused on, on uh, Croatia. And reading these documents, I was stuck to what extent Minuccio was familiar with Croatia situation. I mean, he is all, all these geographical peculiarity, like, like a, like a Turopolia region or Polnia region. That was really all these nuances of Croatian geography. Well, in January the 10th, 1940, uh, 1993, he delivered his famous uh, speech on the Estonia and the controversy, in which actually he addressed the question of Venetian neutrality, um, pointing out some very experienced, very interesting things like the uh, Venetian opportunism. He was basically claiming that the old generation was fed up of war. I mean, uh, Le Panta experience was fresh, and Venice was not uh, ready, basically, to, to, to suffer a new uh, hardship. But also, uh, he actually noticed the changes in Venetian power. I mean, in the 16th century, the Venetian power was entrenched in the so-called the Council of Ten which actually was the most important institution led by very important Venetian aristocrat, Bernardo um, uh, um, Contarini. But then in the 80s, there was a sea change in Venetian politics because the Senate get upper hand, especially the so-called the party of youngsters who just uh, became anti hardwood and anti Open in, 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 in just in following their policy. But be, behind of that, I mean, Clement Day was prone to make a very large uh, European uh, uh, alliance against the uh, Ottoman, which would include not only Venice, but also uh, many Eastern small dukedom, uh, including the Russian. In Poland, he talked even about uh, Persia, Ethiopia, in order to surrender the Ottomans in just to use this opportunity to get rid, to kick out uh, Ottomans from the Balkan Peninsula. But everything depends on Venice. This was a problem because Venice was not ready to engage. And the great Polish uh, king, the Sigismund the, the Vasa, condition uh, actually. Uh, entrance uh, of Poland upon the uh, Venetian joining this coalition. This grand plan and vision, especially engagement of uh, Danubian principalities, naming uh, Transylvania, which was led by the very actually brave and very uh, notorious leader Sigismund Batory, was famous brother of. Uh, Poland King uh, Stepan, the battery, Michael the Brave of Palatia. There was also uh, there was also a plan to engage the Polish Lithuanian King Sigismund III Vasa, but he was basically involved in the Swedish, Swedish uh, actually uh, hereditary questions. And finally, there was a Cossacks, Ukrainian Cossack, who has to engage to time. Uh, the uh, Tatars of Crimea was perceived as a great uh, Ottoman allies. The Battle of Sisak actually arose a great hope between uh, Christianity and then the Pope sent Alexander Komurovich to, to East and Minucci actually wrote, wrote basic instructions to Komurovich. Komurovich was a native of Split. He was uh, at that point, a uh, rector of uh, Illyrian College in Rome, and he had basically to make a large network of these alliances. His uh, hub was to be in Lavo and in Krakow. In through this uh, basically Jesuit network, he has to engage all these rulers in a war against uh, Ottomans. 
He was pretty much successful because in uh, in 1594 there was a big, very successful campaign of uh, Michael de Bray, a singer of Bathory, uh, who basically liberated Romania. There was a famous battle of Bucharest and and Dragoviste, not to go into these nuances of uh, Eastern Battlefront. But the basic problem still was uh, Venice, because although the Christian of East had uh, much a success, they were unable to keep momentum. I mean, without the Venice, without the Venetian fleet, the success was uh, pretty much, pretty much uh, still under question. And uh, on June 13, 1940, uh, 1994, he delivered his speech in Academia della Noti, the Journalment Resultato Sulla Neutralità, in which he basically openly blamed Venice for not entering the war. And it was a very actually sensitive question for him because he was Venetian subject, technically, he was born in Serra Valle. Although he was a provincial nobleman, he uh, grew great resentment with this city. He was perceived, perceived as a vain, as a superficial. He didn't go shoulder to shoulder to Venetian aristocracy, but still, actually, I mean, reading his lecture, he actually felt as an Italian, although he was uh, aware of Italian regional regionalism, but he has a strong resentment to such a neutrally opportunistic or conformistic Venetian uh, policy. And then he basically, um, a challenge to two leading uh, principles in international policy, meaning uh, Regione da Stato, which was a leading principle from Machiavelli, from the theory, which actually uh, was uh, actually leading principle in politics of that time, against uh, Regione di Cielo, which was a um, policy of principality, and he, of course, the only principle who can bring together this uh, uh, Christian uh, Christian co coalition. Uh, also, he actually had uh, lots of enemies at the Popal Korea, uh, coming especially for Habsburg sides. And in these documents, there was a phrase that the Red of the Second the Emperor, the Habsburg Emperor, was Malissimo Sotismata, which Minuccio, because actually. He had uh, some objection on his Navarist uh, history. Actually, Minuccio basically support a rapprochement of Catholic Church with the new, uh, new French King, uh, Henrik IV. And finally, uh, in April uh, 1594, uh, uh, Pope, Pia Minuccio sent to split Giovanni Francesco Allegretti, who was in charge of uh, actually to uh, making up, making a uprising of uh, Christian in um, Balkan hinterland. And um, also with Allegretti went side to side uh, Franjo Bertucevic, one Franciscan born in uh, Hvar, who witnesses uh, uh, Ottoman Oslo, Oslo on island in, during, uh, before, uh, Lep before the Lepanto Viking. And there were also uh, two very important uh, actors in this uh, foreseen uprising, Ivan and Nicola Alberti. Uh, Nicola Alberti was an archidiacon of uh, split uh, capital. And the basic plan was to, to stir up rebellion in a chain of Adriatic cities, meaning Klis, uh, Hetek, Novi, uh, Skada, Doraza, Kruja. In all these documents, it was a phrase coming in XS, come a bite, as a bite to attract Venetia in war. But this uprising has to be staged. Uh, after a stage to be after a uh, popal banner. Uh, Minucci also get the pressure for a uh, large Christian, especially Albanian, uh, 
majority Albanian lobby in, in Rome who was in favor of such uh, endeavor. But uh, the, 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 actually, this situation was not arranged for such a law enterprise. And then uh, Franjo Bertucevic, uh, who was not sympathetic to Minuccio at all, uh, actually decided to approach the head of site and he made a meeting with uh, ambassador, the ambassador in Rome, uh, Harak, local Harak, and then the whole cause was actually handed over to Hasbro side. In that uh, sense, Minuccio felt isolated. He uh, uh, withdrew to Capranica, a small town uh, nearby uh, Rome. And then, uh, actually, in such a position where he was also denied of uh, Cardinal Popper, uh, Bitterbach dynasty pretty much lobbied for Minuch to get uh, Cardinal Popus, but thanks to Hasbro, especially in these documents, are also very visible that a Jesuit Cardinal from Spain, the third Jesuit Cardinal, was also very much opposing such idea. And then the this episode went besides actually uh, Minuccio. Uh, Minuccio claimed that this was ill prepared and this has to reflect the ball, uh, Cleese Falls offended Venice. It was absolutely uh, unacceptable at that point, Venice to have a uh, neighboring Hasburg in uh, Balkan. Balkan hinterland, and uh, actually when it joined the start with Ottoman, and this uh, uprising in place basically failed. Uh, after that, Minucci was uh, offered to go to Zadar as an archbishop. He accepted that position, and he tried to further uh, the reform in his new diocese. It was a pretty much demanding job because he faced opposition uh, coming from a uh, local uh, capital. He was pretty much um, ready for these uh, disciplinary measures. And these companies actually um, pretty much uh, went to Venice, to Venetian Patriarch, and then uh, Minuccio was in a very peculiar situation because he was Venetian subject and still he faced uh, resistance of Iloka Capton, who basically uh, asked for shelter from a uh, Venetian, Venetian uh, Cardinal Priori, Venetian Patriarch Priori. He further uh, reformed in uh, Zala and did the main great things, meaning. Uh, meaning uh, visiting his diocese, uh, organizing uh, local uh, synod, uh, sending uh, to athletic delegations to, to Rome, and pretty much disciplined, disciplined all these uh, canonics who was engaged in concubinat, in trade, in, in lots of these uh, actually uh, very, uh, very bad things. And finally, uh, facing such a position, he uh, asked the Pope for um, giving him a new diocese or uh, basically transforming his uh, new uh, diocese for returning uh, him to, to Italy. And in 1602, he left the Zadar, went to, to Germany, and then he died in 1604 for uh, pneumonia in, in Germany. And after Minuccio death, the, all his world uh, collapsed. Although uh, there was a Rita Torok peace, he had to get Ottoman basically uh, divided their interests with his Hungary. There was also a uh, very well known uh, Uskok war called the War of Gradishka, which actually collided uh, Venice and Hasburg. 
And after that, there was a 30 years war, which actually the, the whole Germany basically collapsed. There was a very harsh battle between capitalists and Protestants. And finally, there was wars in Candia because Minuccio predicted that in Second War, Venice would find himself alone against a mighty Ottoman power. So, uh, in conclusion, I would say that this, uh, his uh, legacy and his uh, correspondence, which is actually today in a German institute in Rome, uh, offers uh, lots of themes, lots of topics. Among, among all the most important are these other letters, about 2,000 other letters, who basically detail all these uh, actually everyday situation is other, especially these, uh, these uh, conditions or these um, actions in uh, Zada capital, all these uh, actually portray a uh, present day situation and you almost can touch this uh, situation. Oh, he was a great inspiration. Of course, he left a legacy as a writer of Historia of Muscozzi. But he was also sort of underdog. Uh, he was not uh, very well accepted in uh, German historiography, who perceived him as a Catholic zealot. Also, he didn't get a very welcoming press in Italian one. He uh, Italian historians perceive him as a man of uh, Rome, not of Venice. And finally, of course, the Croats. Uh, perceive him as an arch enemy of Uskox, which is basically not true. He just tried to settle these Adriatic questions in order, in, in order to bring this Catholic, very important Catholic uh, allies together. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, on this fascinating individual. Uh, if I am uh, correct, our next speaker is Steve Van Place, and he is uh, with us through Zoom. He's going to talk about direct affinity, Venice, Vienna, and the Ottoman in the early modern European history. Uh, and I hope that uh, you can uh, hear us and that we can see Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. I would rather be in Zagreb right now and I can see Yadranka. Can you see me? Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much. Hi. Let me just uh, do some screen sharing and then we'll get this rolling. Uh, just need to get back to the meeting and then we can start. That was great listening to everyone's uh, talks right now. My talk is very different. I will have to tell you that in terms of uh, the way this is going to roll. So here's what I'm going to be talking about. In May 2019, German diplomat Eckhard Eichhoff passed away in Bonn, Germany, aged 92. His death barely registered apart from a couple of obituaries in the expectable papers, including, as you can see here, the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. Any discussion of the intersections of multidimensional entanglements, such as those of the uh, Eastern Adriatic from the late Middle Ages to the present may well, and I would argue appropriately so, begin with the acknowledgement that the subject of my talk, much like Eichhoff's professional and scholarly activities, is similarly neither clearly defined nor treated by scholarship as it should be. In other words, the area and uh, topics in question are notoriously hard to study and with few notable exceptions, which I shall outline in a moment, most available studies are self-delimiting in time, space and our focus. In my contribution, I shall endeavor to explore the place of the Eastern Adriatic in history with an open mind and as an ongoing process. So what follows is, as I mentioned, very different from the uh, original research presented in the earlier papers. 
but it's also something of a chimera, an exercise in uh, historiographic accounting and an attempt to understand in the dual sense outlined by Max Weber, that is the uh, direct observational understanding of the subjective meaning of a given interpretation, and of course, its uh, explanatory qualities. So just to briefly go over this, so I will not go bore you with the trivialities of recounting facts from the end of Roman antiquity to the modern era. Uh, I will just briefly contextualize my talk, then I'll have three brief, uh, let's say, moments in which I'm going to be speaking about Venetian uh, historiography, Habsburg studies, and some comments on the Ottoman Empire, and then I will have a kind of like a conclusion, tentative one about what we need to do. So <clears throat> uh, I will start by saying that human geography plays an outsized role. What do I mean by this? So just look at this. This is uh, the current, let's say, outline of how people think about Europe. And I've added uh, where I think kind of the Eastern Adriatic might be. So geography, let's define it first, shall have two meanings. On the one hand, we are talking about the physical realities and constraints in human activities, such as settlements, uh, production, communication, etc., including, of course, all matters of war and peace. Yet there is also a second angle, which is perhaps even more telling than any amount of data on, say, urbanization, international commerce, weather patterns, and the like. I'm talking about human perceptions, past and present, which intimately connect our ancestors' experiences to our own, mediated as always by the historical records in its ever-changing individual and collective imaginations. This is not merely a perceptual problem. It is also a scholarly problem of considerable importance. What actually is the area we are talking about? Where would it begin or end, spatially speaking? How may we denote its boundaries? Just take, uh, let's say, these uh, illustrations here. Uh, so the one is from the Vatican's uh, Galleria delle Carte Geografiche. Uh, and the other one is, of course, uh, Hermann Moll's uh, wonderful map from 1721. So as you can see in the picture on the left from the Vatican uh, for Ignazio Danti, uh, of course, the Eastern Adriatic was part of Italy. This becomes a little bit more problematic 150 years later as the image on the right-hand side intimates because there is something of a yellow blob which indicates Germany, kind of, and there is a green area which says Turkey. So you can see it's not so easy to ponder the anachronistic nature of any clear-cut uh, assumption and its uh, intellectual sibling, spatially ill-defined geographic parameters, which are perhaps even impossible to define. So my paper is not just about changing perspectives or the acknowledge acknowledgement of uh, shifting historical mentalities, but I would like to uh, discuss an analytical epistemological problem of the first order what areas, which cultures, peoples, powers, and territories, I would argue all in the plural, are we actually talking about? So let's start from three uh, basic considerations. The Eastern Adriatic shall be understood as an area without any clearly defined boundaries that shifted considerably across time and space. This implies, second, that there was no unity, no loss, less uniformity after the withering away of the Roman Empire in late antiquity. Hence, we shall, or even must, disagree, however spuriously this may sound, with the Brodalian hypothesis of Mediterranean unity. unity. Why, third, one may, may object, would we need to unnecessarily complicate matters like this? We shall, I say must, perhaps, place the Eastern Adriatic within what may be called a repertoire of expressions of group identities then, um, in and especially across different places, spaces and times. Forty years ago, Peter Burke warned of the intellectual fallacy of what he called, quote, historical synecdoche, by which he meant, quote, the conscious ident identification of the whole of Europe with some part of it, 
to which the speaker belongs. I move to propose that this also works in the reverse. Thus prepared, let us briefly traverse the historiographies of the Venetian Republic, the Habsburg monarchy, and the Ottoman Empire. Venice's history, its obscure origins, meteoric rise around the first turn, turn of the first millennium, the partial domination of the Mediterranean world economy in the late Middle Ages and enduring existence until 1797, serves as a telling point of departure. Celebrated by Renaissance humanists like Marino Sanuto, Gasparo Contarini and others, the Republic's history was shrouded by a curious admixture of fact and fiction, commonly referred to as the myths of Venice. The most important fact to note here are first that scholarship paid, pays I would argue, excessive attention to Venice proper while, on the other hand, the Republic's vast domains in mainland Italy, the terra ferma, and the Eastern Mediterranean, the Stato da Mar, remain comparatively under-researched to this day. Curiously enough, while at first this uneven scholarly treatment arose mainly due to competing ethno-nationalist aspirations by Greek, Yugoslav, and Italian scholarship, which gave rise to selective interpretations and perceptions of their shared Venetian past. These tendencies, of course, played out quite differently as Venice's history was impressed to serve the purposes of nationalist movements in the second half of the 19th century, and nationalistic, increasingly exclusionary ends during the first half of the 20th century. After World War II, Venetian historiography entered the ideological conflict between East versus West. Venice's overseas possession entered uh, the ideologically charged discourse exemplified by, for instance, Freddy Thierry's uh, historical materialistic uh, scholarship, while especially American scholarship by uh, Frederick Lane and William Bousma reimagined the Serenissimus republicanism as part and parcel of a mostly imaginary long-standing Western tradition. By the late 20th century, however, neither approach had or could withstand scrutiny, hence the demystification of Venice, spearheaded by James Grubb, John Martin, Dennis Romano, and others. In short, while recent and contemporary scholarship, quote, has done away with the unilinear reading of Venice's past, the focus of scholarly attention continues to rest firmly and overwhelmingly so on the Lagoon metropolis, with much less attention being paid to the terra ferma and even, so to speak, less on the Eastern Adriatic. So here we can note the curious uh, disconnects, academically speaking, between the scholarship by people such as Grga Novak, uh, Tomis Lavrauka, Levin Budak, and many, many others I'm uh, spuriously omitting here, versus the few uh, wonderful studies that came out, for example, uh, of the Triplex Confinium project of the 1990s, uh, and the more recent scholarship by, and here too, I'm of course omitting so many uh, colleagues and friends, so please uh, just bear with me on this. Uh, more recent scholarship by, say, Thea Mehu or Fabian Kummler, just to name a few. So let's move on to Habsburg studies. And the situation is roughly similar, albeit for different reasons. Speaking very broadly, from its inception in the mid-19th century, scholarship was and continues to be decisively Vienna and elite-centric. Prior to World War I, Austrian historical research very much mirrored the conceptual and ideological predispositions of its mainly German-speaking upper-class and bourgeois protagonists. Contrary to Venetian historiography, whose purview remained firmly focused or limited on the city-state, the history... Pardon... The history of the Habsburg monarchy was portrayed as a gradual, if non-linear, expansion of central authority. Initially, this came about by the increasingly close collaboration between crown, church, and estates, and subsequently augmented by state activism related to the army, the bureaucracy, and the economy from the mid-18th century onwards. To the monarchy's non-German peoples, the Bohemians, the Hungarians, the South Slavs, uh, these dynamics um, uh, represented foreign domination that, while of use against Christendom's hereditary enemy, 
as threatening, uh, was deemed threatening to their ancient rights and freedoms traditionally enjoyed by the various regions' estates. Rarely, if ever, did the various academic nationalists consider the common people, for like the German-speaking peers, most Czech, Martyr, and Yugoslav or South Slavic historians also hailed from similar class backgrounds. It wasn't before the post-1945 forced triumph of materialistic scholarship that any of these national traditions cared much, if at all, for commoners. <clears throat> As regards the fate of post-1918 Habsburg studies, we note two closely related main trends, one geographic and the other interpretative. On the one hand, Austria-Hungary ceased to exist in 1918, and virtually all established narratives of Habsburg rule were carried over into the interwar period and beyond, with the exception of the almost complete loss of status of the former ruling dynasty. All successor states were themselves multinational, and their respective elites elevated their own exclusionary national histories to the status of a master narrative that, however farcically, echoed the various 19th century accounts of foreign domination and oppression by the dynasty's narrow-minded Catholic zealotry, albeit from an inverse perspective, yet with comparable blind spots. So this is perhaps best illustrated by the notion of temno or darkness in uh, Czech uh, history and historiography, uh, the replacement uh, of Hungarian uh, Habsburg kings from uh, in Heroes Square Hersek Tere in uh, Budapest by uh, the communist government after the 1956 uprising, or the notion of uh, Habsburg rule from the late middle medieval uh, centuries, 15th century to 1918, as an, a mere quote interlude by Austrian post-1945 scholarship. So that's the one part. Let's talk briefly about the second issue here, because with few precious exceptions, and irrespective of differing ideological convictions, post-1918 scholarship remained uh, within the limits imposed both by pre-1914 nationalistic traditions and post-1918-45 borders, or you might add post-1990-91 borders. In this, Habsburg studies mirror to certain degrees the problems afflicting Venetian historiography with its differentiations between the city proper, the terra firma, and the stato da mar. In both instances, the Cold War further restricted archival access while sharply reducing reciprocal exchange. Rapidly declining language competences characterized historiographies on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Curiously enough, both historiographies sought comfort uh, in a more remote past, be it the golden age of medieval Prague and the Hussite revolution in the Czech case, or Yugoslav scholars' emphases on medieval Serbia pre-1102 Croatia, the period between the peace accords of Sada in 1358 and the renewal of Venetian domination after 1409, or the celebration of the Ragusan Republic as South Slavic polity. Let us shift gears and focus, however briefly, uh, and talk about the Ottomans by connecting them to the Eastern Adriatic and Habsburg Central Europe. This is typically done in the time-honored, if anachronistic way of bringing up Christendom's hereditary enmity, a trope that has exhibited an enduring shelf life. While in international relations terminology, Venetian foreign policy versus the Ottoman Empire became quite realistic after a string of 16th century defeats, the ill-defined boundaries between especially the Habsburg and Ottoman areas in East Central Europe were a constant cause of concern throughout most of the early modern period. Ottoman military superiority barely kept in check by Christendom's various anti-moral defenders during the 15th and 16th centuries, eventually morphed into uh, a kind of stalemate before the late 17th century, at which point following the second siege of Vienna, European war fighting eventually outcompeted its adversary with the expansion of Habsburg authority as its main consequence. Yet in historiographic terms, the Ottoman Empire served a contradictory role. The conventional boogeyman of European affairs, of course, but Istanbul was also a major ally in World War I. Still the main tropes of the sick man of Europe and fairly conventional allegations of confessional intolerance against the Sultan's Christian subjects 
which I think are by and large projections of Europeans' own reprehensible conduct in these regards, characterized most European scholarship as any glimpse, however briefly, into, say, Franz Babinger's biography of Mehmet II or the utterances voiced by Austro-fascist dictator Engelbert Dolfus on the occasion of the 215th anniversary of the Battle of Vienna in mid-September 1933, amply illustrate. So uh, just one brief side comment about Babinger's biography of uh, Mehmet II. Uh, here I mean the... Uh, first German edition, which came out shortly after World War II, the uh, English translation done by uh, Princeton University Press, which appeared in 1978, uh, is conspicuously cleaned up of very many, uh, very uh, derogatory and orientalist uh, verbiage in this regard. So by the late 20th century, this stance began to change as the Babinger biography illustrates. Turkish scholars participated in a number of conferences around 1983, that's the 300th anniversary of the siege, a change of sentiments perhaps aided by the Ottoman's descendants' long return march as guest workers after 1945. Around the turn of the millennium, the Ottoman Empire was definitely on its way back into early modern Europe, uh, as the works by Daniel Goffman, uh, Tiana Kristic, and uh, also among our our uh, spectators here, Georg Michels, among others, amply illustrate. So I will stop the uh, historiographic accounting at this point, for I would like to use the remainder of my time, I'll be done in two or three minutes, to sketch, however, imprecisely the similarities and discrepancies between these three fields. To do so, I shall use the markers fact versus fiction, geography, and the aforementioned historiographic shifts as signposts to outline a few avenues of research that are very much worth pursuing. All historiographic traditions come with their own myths and Venetian, Habsburg and Ottoman studies are by no means different. All other things equal, their most problematic abuses, however, are selection bias and lack of interdisciplinary approaches. All three polities were run by tight-knit oligarchic factions, perhaps the Ottoman Empire a bit less so, Yet there is hardly any mention of social property relations in recent research, such as by uh, Alfani and Di Tullio, which came out in 2019 with Cambridge, or Bill Gotz's uh, 2018 Oxford University Press uh, monograph on the Habsburg Empire. Economic history and theory, while often subsumed in business school outside German language academia, but this must not count as an excuse, I would add, by now is hardly to be found among most historians whose purview and main interest is, are almost exclusively revolving around the cultural and perceptual turns of late. Contrary to ideologically inspired appropriations of Western style republicanism during the Cold War, there is now a partially excessive attention, Pavel Himmel wrote, devoted to the historical powers that be, first and foremost, the aristocracy. So there is a second blind spot here. And with few exceptions, this holds true for all three fields. Comparable, if slightly variegated, reservations apply in terms of geography. Post-1918-45, 90s borders everywhere influenced scholarship, yet the common denominators are a growing internationalization of scholarship on the one hand, which at the same time leads to increasingly uh, conceptual and epistemological insularity on the other hand. This may sound contradictory at first, but do consider the sad fact that most of the recent, more recent literature, say the essays in Venice Reconsidered, which came out in 2000, and the more recent companion uh, edited by Eric Dursella with respect to Venice, Thomas Winkelbauer's Ständefreiheit and und Fürstenmacht, or Hochedlinger's Austria's Wars of Emergence, are summaries at best overshadowed by and certainly not more illuminating than Brodel's Mediterranean and Lane's Maritime Republic, Oswald Redlich's two-volume account on the period from 1648 to 1740, or P.G.M. Dixon's Finance and Government under Maria Theresia. The situation is even worse in terms of Ottoman studies as far as I can, as, uh, can tell, but Michels's Habsburg Empire under siege and Yazir Yilmaz's forthcoming The Road to 1683 certainly look much, much more promising as does to be as Daniel's uh, contribution to this conference. 
there is but a third uh, elective affinity that unites all these fields, and it has to do with how the histories were interpreted once the polities were no longer. At first, both domestic and international scholars were united in their rather negative overall assessment. Just briefly, domestic, by domestic, I mean scholars who work on the subject, who are within the states or successor states uh, that are concerned, whereas international is, I think, self-explanatory. Nationalist and totalitarianist Germanizations aside, Venice was viewed much more positively in the West after 1945, both by Italian and international scholarship. Habsburg studies made that particular leap, at least partially during the later 20th century, even though domestic and international scholarship continues to be in disagreement about this. It appears that Ottoman studies are currently undergoing a quite comparable transformation especially with regards to how it's viewed by international scholarship. And this is the last one. What then is to be done? In his review of the fourth edition of Eickhoff's account, by now retired uh, University of Vienna professor Karl Fotzelke considered its merits as follows. Quote, this book is a long seller. It appeared in its first edition in 1970, by the way. In the truest sense of the term, Fotzelka writes, quote, its great achievement is that Eickhoff treats together two themes that are usually considered separately. That is the uh, uh, affairs looked at from the Venetian point of view in the maritime uh, theater, as well as the uh, Habsburg Ottoman fights in East Central Europe in the land war area. The separation and exclusion of all things Eastern in mainstream Western scholarship is more than regrettable. And there are very few, mainly Byzantine scholars, a handful of uh, source loving medievalists and early modernists who are working on these topics and areas. Uh, so just briefly, because I mentioned this here on the slide, um, there is no papacy and the Levant that deals with uh, what happened after Lepanto. And if you look at especially Wiesner Hanks's uh, fourth edition of say women's and gender in uh it's, i think it's women and gender in early modern history the fourth edition came out with cambridge uh the ottoman empire is mentioned once in the entire book whereas orthodox christianity figures i think if i recall correctly six times these are the figures given and you can follow them up in the uh, index of wiesner hanks's volume so i think if and this is my way of concluding concluding this we who are con uh, here do not need any more words to spur us all into action because we know what needs to be done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. That was very interesting. Uh, fortunately, we are running rather late. I don't know whether we have uh, at least a brief uh, a few few minutes for, uh, for coffee, and then we continue to our fifth, fourth panel of the day. Um, thank you all. Uh, I would like to conclude. Uh, so just to say thank you very much for being with us, Stefan. Stefan. Yeah. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for having me, and I'm so sorry I couldn't come in person. Thanks, <laughs> And I'm looking forward to seeing you all before again too long again. Thank you all. See you, see you all in a few minutes. Claudia, are you listening for us? Claudia? No. Okay, later. Okay. Hello. So, just to, to inform that we are, we are going to have a short 10 minutes pause for, for coffee. Okay. Are you really ready? Thank you. Thank you.
Oh, 
in Vienna during the pontificate of Innocent the 11th. We are now uh, in late uh, 17th century as we slowly uh, progress towards the modern times. So uh, without further ado, and since we are already running a bit late, uh, Claudia, uh, please, uh, yeah, you can start with your talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Jedranka Neralvic and the Croatian Institute of History for inviting me, and many thanks for the organization of the interesting conference, as well as the patients in organizing the convention, which has been postponed for one year due to the COVID situation. The topic today concerning the written acts of the Apostolic Noon Show at the Interior Court Francesco Bonvisi, as they are available to us in his extensive correspondence with Rome and beyond. The presentation is based on recent research as part of the ongoing PhD thesis and an incipient project to edit the Cononciature correspondence of Francesco Bonvisi during his time as public representative at the Imperial Court in Vienna. On 6 March 1678, the papal diplomat at the Vienna Nunciatur, Francesco Bonvisi, sent a letter from Vienna to the Cardinal Secretary of the State, Alderano Cibo, reporting on the result of the private audience with the Emperor Leopold I. I. Deus Bonvisi reports in writing the following about the oral conversion with the Emperor. I quote the relevant passage in an English translation. I represented to His Majesty the resolution that the Sacred Congregation of the Council had taken in the case between Monsignor Bishop of Bamberg and Elhabi Bali with his chapters, and all the reason that he had for declaring valid his capitulations sworn before and after the election. His Holiness ordered that the declaration should not be published so that his majesty would have the opportunity to extrajudicially settle the present differences which could bring so much disturbance to the empire. Bonvisi expressed his praise and appreciation for the decision of Pope Innocent Odyskalki to give the resolution of the Congregation of the Council secret for the Pope's proposal of an extrajudicial solution as a way of settling the controversy. The controversy could ultimately only reach a provisional agreement with the conclusion of the Vienna Alliance, Vienna Alliance on 13 October 1678. It was a conflict between the cathedral chapters of Bamberg and Würzburg and the Bishop Peter Philipp von Dambach. The dispute ignited over the alliance policy of Bishop Dambach with Emperor Leopold I in the face of the French treat to the empire and the associate 
excessive costs of maintaining troops, which seriously called into question the economic resilience of the two dioceses. In addition, the chapters accused the bishop of several violations of the oath he had taken, the Pacta Conventa. In the end, the cathedral chapter appealed to the Pope and the congregation of the council responsible for the questions of the legal binding nature of the bishop's electoral capitulations. According to the decrees of the Council of Trent, the cardinal members of the congregation of the council considered the prince bishop to have violated an juramentum and decided that the oaths he had taken must be respected, those invalidating the alliance with the emperor. The interesting thing is that Pope Innocent XI ordered that no decree be written about the decision, but that the emperor should resolve the conflict with his authority and mediation. In this letter to Alderano Cibo, Bonwisi describes in detail the emperor's reaction to the Pope's decision not to publish the decree of the congregation and instead to place the solution to the matter under the authority of the emperor. When Bonwisi writes, beginning of the quote, his majesty listened to me with great attention and with such a joyful face that before he spoke, he made me understand the joy he felt at seeing himself so loved and esteemed by his holiness and then expressed to me in such a blind ways that I am unable to describe them. He infinitely praised the prudence of this holiness, supporting him in the treaty of the extrajudicial settlement to which he trusted that I would still have contributed. As an aside, it's highly interesting how Bonwisi reproduces a conversation that takes place orally and also describes the emperor's reaction in detail. Leopold I accepted Rome's proposed solution to bring about the Concordia in this controversy and affirmed that he would contribute to the settlement with every industria. Bonwisi was to support the emperor in this regard. In this way, the Apostolic Nuncio acted in the audience with Emperor Leopold in accordance with the extraordinary instruction and the letter accompanying the instruction sent by the Secretary of the State, which he received a month earlier in February 1676. It was a decisive turning point in the negotiation, which gave Bonwisi extensive autonomy in future negotiations to settle this conflict between the prince bishop and the cathedral chapters. He instrumentalized the two instructions in the negotiations between March and October 1678 in two ways. On the one hand, this is done through the extensive written correspondence with the Secretariat of the State and the Congregation of the Council, as well as in the occasion related correspondence with the actor, actor involved in the process. On the other hand, Bonwisi attempted to bring an agreement between the disputing parties by extrajudicial procedures through personal interaction, that is face-to-face -face communication, such as in the audience with the emperor or in the talks between the Vainis Nuncio and the deputies of the bishop and the two cathedral chapters in Partibus. Without clearly defined guidance, and those sufficient knowledge in, of the causa and his circumstances, which the Papal Nuncio ultimately had with the extraordinary instruction, Francesco Bonwisi did not dare to intervene actively in the proceedings, and those passed structured in knowledge to the Roman Curia. This is always done in written form, through contentions and occasion-based correspondence. correspondence. My question in this controversy between Dernbach and the cathedral chapters of Bamberg and Würzburg focused on two issues. Firstly, what was the relationship between information and knowledge in connection with the, action, with the actions of the papal diplomat Bonwisi? And secondly, how is the relationship between action 
and writing presented. After all, the nuncio had to put all negotiation practices and all statement important for the decision making into a written form in order to keep Rome informed about the course of, of their negotiations. The continuous high frequency rhythm of correspondence as well as establishment of a shared context of knowledge that keeps the procedure of negotiation up to date serves as a guide for the apostolic nuncio in their diplomatic activities and also independent diplomatic activities on the local level. It created a space of action for the papal envoy. The course of negotiation practices and all statements important for decision-making followed the basic principle of the written form or through oral procedural, uh, procedural elements ensured a complement in the writing-based process procedure. Only in the synopsis of the principle of written form on the one hand and the inseparable relationship between information and action, respectively negotiation on the other, are two separate phenomena, but rather two phenomena that are related to each other and that present themselves as indissoluble. The two directive to negotiate and to inform cannot be separated in the courier practice of reporting. I use the term written acts for this in German, verschriftlichte Handlungen. This statement reveals a phenomenon of papal diplomatic history that has not yet been the focus of historical nunciature research, the cultural history of early modern envoy reports which represents an important architectural element in the new history of diplomacy and appears as an important backbone of the government of the Catholic Church. As Christine Roll writes in the introduction of the anthology Berichten als kommunikative Herausforderung, reporting as a communicative challenge, which was published a week ago, European envoys reports are considered, I quote, the blind spot of self-reflection in the history of diplomacy. The researching gates should be directed away from the envoys to the reports, more precisely to the reports as artifacts, the practices of reporting and the handling of the reports. Ending of the quote. The focus here is on the practices of reporting and the handling of reports by the central institution of the Roman Curia, which served as a central tool of administration and control of in the government of the Roman Curia and the Pope on the local churches. The transmission of important in the form of written reports continuously changed the perspectives of the nuncio and the Curia and those the actions. The viability of this methodical approach will be illustrated using the already presented example of the controversy of the Bishop Dernbach with his cathedral chapters of Bamberg and Würzburg. The time of Francesco Bonvisi as apostolic nuncio at the imperial court between September 1675 and August 1689 was astonishing in several respects. Bonvisi worked for a total of 18 years in Scabrosissime Nunciature, rough nunciatures. Furthermore, the diplomat, who had already proven himself in Cologne and Poland, remained at the Viennese Nunciature for 14 years. The extremely above average duration was compounded by the peculiar peculiarity that Bonvisi remained at the imperial court for years even after his promo promotion to the rank of Cardinal of September 1st, 1681. We are fortunate that the complete personal archive of the Apostolic Nuncio Bonvisi has been preserved and it's now in the family archive in Luca. This correspondence has hardly been analyzed so far and it's still partly unpublished. The extraordinarily cohesive written tradition of the Bonvisi correspondence 
shall be examined very brief in the following. By evaluating von Wies's correspondence, the following distinctions can be made with regard to the processing of extensive written sources. Firstly, the official correspondence of the Papal Nuncio von Wiese with the Secretary of the State, Alderano Chibo. In total, it is a correspondence of about 13,000 letters and the enclosures exchanged between Vienna and Rome between 1676 and in August 1689. Secondly, the continuous semi-official correspondence with other courier officials outside the Secretary of the State. So, for example, the Cardinal Protector Carlo Pio di Savoia, the Secretary of the CIFA, Agostino Favoriti, or his colleagues at the various papal representations like the considerable number of letters exchanged between 1618 and September 1688 with Opizio Pallavicino, Papa representative in Varsavia. Thirdly, the occasion related correspondence. This includes correspondence with sovereigns and princes, secular diplomats, as well as letters addressed to the Nuncio on specific occasions the Nuncio's letters with the various addresses. This includes, but also the correspondence with persons active in the Roman Curia, more important for me, the correspondence with the congregations. And here I came back to the matter of controversy between the Prince Bishop of Bamberg and Würzburg with his cathedral chapters. As already mentioned, in February 1678, Bonwiese received an extraordinary instruction and a cipher explaining the instruction in more detail. This was a decisive turning point in the negotiation as Bonwiese moved from the role of an active informant of Rome to the role of active actor with wide autonomy in the future negotiations to settle the conflict between the Prince Bishop and the cathedral chapters. It served him as an action guiding norm for the negotiations between March and October 1678. The unusual future of this, of this two instruction lies in the different weighting of the instruction for action by the Secretary of the State Chibo and the Viennese Nuncio Bonwisi. Bonwisi attached greater importance to the coded letter accompanying the instruction, then to the instruction in piano. This was done against the background that the former had been sent to the nuncio as a coded official letter and those had a higher degree of officiality. The second major difference between the two letters can be observed in the formulation of the content. In contrast to the separate letter, the instruction in piano is more detailed. In addition, the special future of the enciphered instruction lies in the absence of the information that the invalidity of the alliance between the Prince Bishop and the Emperor Leopold as a result of the decision of the Congregation of the Council must not be mentioned in future negotiations of Bonwisi. On the other hand, the Sifat letter provided instructions for dealing with the invalidity of the alliance between Danbach and the Emperor. For this reason, as Bonwisi wrote, mi sono regolato sopra le cifre. I settled on the Sifat. Ultimately, in this controversy, it is up to Bonwisi to decide which of the issued instructions for action by the Secretary of the State is realized in the negotiations process. He gave greater importance to the Sifat letter since it better explained the reasons for the invalidity of the alliance. In order to make the negotiations successful, however, the Nunjo turned against the order given by the Secretary of the State, Shibo, and decided independently which action proved to be the better way to achieve reconciliation. Bonwisi was criticized by Chibo for disclosing the resolution of the Congregation of the Council to the Emperor, which was to keep secret. 
However, as a result of his undaunted success in negotiation with the emperor, and that he succeeded with his mediation policy, Bonwisi was finally praised for his diplomatic skill in this matter. The settlement between Danbach and his cathedral chapter was finally achieved after long negotiation with the conclusion of the Vienna Alliance on 13 October 1678. I will now summarize the results. According to the observations made, it cannot be denied that the various reports and procedures of the Roman Curia follow the principle of writing. All statements were important for decision-making had to be convened through writing, through reporting in order to develop an effect, a legal effect. The example showed that the exchange of knowledge between Rome and Vienna had to establishment a common context of knowledge served Nuncio Bonwisi as a guide for his diplomatic activities as well as his independent diplomatic activities on the local level. Yet only the indexing of the entire correspondence, the complete information, la piena informazione, as it also became a fixed formula in the nunciature correspondence, represents the key through which a nunciature, nunciature's relevant matters are expressed and offers a comprehensive picture on the understanding of a nunciature as a knowledge processing institution and as written acts as a tool of government of the Curia Romana. In the synopsis of the correspondence, therefore, it is possible to understand the involvement of the nuncio and papal policy between 1676 and 1689. And at the same time, the difficult relations between Rome, the Casa di Austria, and especially the local churches. Here, important information were reported on the internal politics of the Curia Romana and the religious political affairs of the empire and of the local churches, but also on the relations of the Nunciature of Bonvisi and the imperial court with the rest of Europe. The highly organized system of communication, the duplicity and multiple strands through additional channels proves to be a fundamental tool of the government of the Roman Curia and provides an extraordinary richness to the cultural history of papal diplomacy, which places the report, the written acts at the center of the analysis. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia. Um, our next speaker is Isabella Vilmos Nihalik of Etwesh Loran <coughs> University, uh, who focuses on the history of the Hungar uh, Hungarian church history of the 17th, 18th century. And he will be you know, uh, pursuing this, uh, uh, you know, building on this same uh, theme, picking you for the same thing and a uh, theme. And we'll be talking about the Habsburg uh, uh, Ottoman, uh, pardon, uh, excuse me, Habsburg uh, cu curial relations uh, during the Habsburg Ottoman, uh, during the end of the Habsburg Ottoman War that resulted in the Treaty of Karlovitz. Um, uh, so the, top, the, the title of the talk is the Nuncio, the Bishop and the Cardinal, Diplomatic Relations between the Viennese Court and the Holy See before the Treaty of Karlovitz in 1696 to 1699. So uh, the floor is yours. For the invitation, I uh, started the quotation. I put uh, on page uh, of speech.
So I quote, I thank the divine majesty that the Apostolic Nuncio has nothing to do with this treaty, end of quote. The sentence had been written by Andrea Santa Croce, Nuncio to Vienna, to his brother, the Marquess Antonio Santa Croce, in autumn 1698, in regard to the upcoming peace congress between the Holy League and the Ottoman Empire. Although the paraphrase referred to the costliness of the peace negotiations, it expressed to some extent the attitude of the Holy See about the last decade of the Great Turkish War. In 1696, two new diplomats arrived to Vienna. Andrea Santa Croce, as the new Papa Nuncio, came from Borso in the summer, while Fra Juan de Santa Maria, Franciscan friar, Bishop of Sosuna, was sent by the Spanish court as their new ambassador. As two prelates, they had a special connection with Cardinal Leopold Kolonich, the influential politician of the Viennese court and the primate of Hungary, Archbishop of Estergo. Although the Holy League was organized by Pope Innocent XI, uh, who was mentioned in uh, Claudia's uh, paper, the Holy See's policy had, had changed significantly by the 1690s. The Nine Years' War between, the, between France and the Habsburgs and their allies also extended to northern Italy, threatening the Papal States and their thieves. The main goal of Pope Innocent XII was to restore the peace, especially in northern Italy. In this regard, the expulsion of the Ottoman Empire from East Central Europe became a secondary issue. After 1692, the Pope supported Emperor Leopold only with pious prayers and fine words, but promised any further financial support just in case of a peace treaty with France. The Viennese court was caught between two fires and was forced to end at least one of the two wars. Obviously, his allies were always pressing the emperor to end the other war. Although Spanish uh, diplomacy tried to persuade the Pope to support the emperor financially against the Ottomans, Madrid also didn't want Leopold to end the French war. In my paper, I examine how did that three prelates, Kolonich, Santa Croce, and Solsona, cooperated to secure the peace as they tried to reconcile the conflicting interests of their court. My main sources uh, were the official correspondence of Nuncio Santa Croce to the Cardinal Secretary, uh, and also his private letters to his brother, and the letters of Bishop Sosuna to an unknown person at the Roman Curia, probably Vincenzo Ricci, the Secretary of Cypher. After the Bishop of Sosuna arrived to Vienna, the Cardinal Secretary ordered Nuncio Santa Croce in a cipher to cooperate with the Spanish ambassador, who will be a great help uh, for him because the Bishop has great piety, uh, I quote, uh, has great piety and zeal for the good service of God and the Holy See and the whole. Santa Croce's greatest fear of Bishop Sosuna was more ceremonial, but which form of address he should use in their correspondence, illustrissima or eccellenza. The personality of the Spanish ambassador is well illustrated by his reply that he has little interest in such formalities, and moreover, I quote, that there are two beautiful words in the Italian dictionary books, which are ella e lei, end of quote. However, the Bishop of Sosuna was in direct correspondence with the Holy See. He wasn't communicating through the Nuncio. In one of his first letters to the Holy See, Bishop Sosuna argued that Pope Innocent should give the Emperor financial support against the Ottomans. He underlined that the war in Hungary has nothing to do with the war with France. He suggested that the Pope should provide targeted aid to fortify the fortresses in the reconquered territories. The bishop argued that the Holy See had previously only given money to fortify 
the recaptured Buddha. I should, uh, I should note uh, that So Sun was misinformed uh, since in uh, 1692, a papal aid had also been sent for the fortification of Osiak and Petrovaradin in Slavonia and of Orada at the Transylvanian border. So Sun emphasized that France would have no objection to such specific aid since there could be no accusation that Vienna was spending the Pope's money against the French. But such a decision would, would be welcomed in Vienna, where the general view is that Pope Innocent prefers France, which is an ally of the Ottoman Empire. However, somewhat maliciously, the bishop noted that the question of papal aid neither hinders nor brings closer the universal peace in Europe among Christians. Although neither Solsona nor the, nor the Nuncio mentioned it, the figure, no, the figure uh, of Cardinal Kolonich looms in the background. A week before the Spanish ambassador letter, uh, ambassador's letter, Kolonich had a long dis discussion with the Nuncio. The main subject was again the question of financial aid. Kolonich suggested, with papal permission, to tax, church, to tax the church revenues, they should be allowed to collect 200,000 florins. Donuncio couldn't, of course, deviate from the policy of the Holy See. The papal treasury was scarce and the general Christian peace in Europe should be concluded first. Against this, Kolonich, albeit in different words, argued in the same way as the Spanish ambassador a week later. One war cannot end without the other. Such a covert collaboration between Kolonich and the Spanish ambassador is further suggested by a letter from Solsona in March of 1697. In this letter, the bishops stressed again, again the dangers that could adversely affect the earlier, earlier military results in Hungary. The recaptured fortresses were in ruin due to the earlier sieges, Therefore, they were open for another Ottoman campaign, and, and the Holy See still didn't allow to the, the taxation of the church revenues, which could bring up, uh, bring in up to 300,000 florins. It's also now emphasized that Cardinal Kolonich and four other bishops guaranteed that they would find that money from such a church tax, because the threat to in Hungary is in the, indeed great. At the same time, preparations for the end of uh, the French war uh, were already underway. Uh, however, cooperation between Vienna and Rome and between the Nuncio and the Spanish ambassador wasn't smooth. The Pope had offered to mediate, but the Viennese court didn't, con didn't consider it advisable for a Papa Nuncio to participate in the peace negotiations. However, without waiting for any instructions from Rome, Nuncio Santa Croce thanked the emperor for his response to Pope Innocent's brief. Cardinal Secretary Fabrizio Spada questioned the Nuncio why he had thanked the emperor for such a response. Finally, Bishop Solsona had tried to excuse the Nuncio in a letter sent to the Secretariat of State. From a private letter written by the Nuncio to his brother, we knew that the Spanish ambassador advised uh, the Nuncio to thank Emperor Leopold for his reply, which put him in a rather awkward position at the Secretariat of State. However, the Spanish ambassador was considered in Vienna as one of the greatest promoter uh, for the universal peace with France. Two successive imperial ambassadors to Madrid, father and son, were the main instigators at, uh, at the Viennese court's uh, opposition against Solsona. The father, Count Ferdinand Bonaventura von Harak, the imperial ambassador to Madrid until 1697, constantly accused Solsona of moving the court of Madrid towards peace against the interests of Vienna. His son, Aloha Thomas von Harak, went even further in the next year. He accused Solsona of reporting all internal secrets from the Viennese court to the Holy See, from where his, this uh, information 
was passed directly and immediately to the French. The delicate, the delicate situation of both the Nuncio and the Spanish ambassador is summed up in the autumn of 1697 and the spring of 1698. With the conclusion of the peace of Ryswick, uh, Pope Innocent, uh, Innocent's goal was finally achieved and peace was restored uh, between the Christian rulers and thus uh, in northern uh, Italy. It also opened the way for papal aid against Ottomans. Although with a little delay, the Viennese court received 200,000 florins in spring of 1698. The Pope only required Cardinal Kolonich and the Nuncio should supervise the spending of the money. As the Nuncio remarked with no little sarcasm, um, this was a wise decision because uh, if the money had been entrusted to the court chamber, it would, have, it would have been quickly dissipated at the wishes of the empress, the king of the Romans, and the court monks, confessors, and nuns. In the end, Cardinal Kolonich came up with a proposal that was certainly acceptable to Rome. For years, the Pope complained to the imperial ambassadors that Vienna was accepting help from Protestant princes against the Ottomans. The imperial diplomacy tried to argue that all help was needed against the Ottoman Empire, including the Protestant princes, especially, especially as the so-called most Christian king, Louis XIV, was helping the Turks in the meantime. Therefore, in May of 1698, Cardinal Kolonich, through Nuncio Santa Croce, proposed to the new Holy See that the Protestant troops be paid their wages from the papal aid and replaced by Catholic troops from Bavaria, Salzburg, and Milan. This was an easy promise for Kolonich to make because preparations for the peace with the Ottoman, Ottomans were already well underway in Vienna. The victory uh, at Zenta on, 11, on the 11th of September 1690, uh, 1697 finally broke the Ottoman Empire's attempt to turn the war around. At the end of the, uh, April 1698, Sosona learned from the secretary of the English ambassador to Constantinople that the Turks had indeed asked the English to intermediate for peace. As far as could be known, the Turks had initially agreed to the treaty on the basis, basis of the principle of uti possidetis for the Habsburgs and Venice. This meant that both Vienna and Venice could keep uh, the territories they had occupied. However, somewhat contradicting this, the Ottomans later demanded that Transylvania uh, remain neutral with an independent prince, and that some Slavonian fortresses such as Petrovaradin and Osir, should be destroyed. So soon as so clearly that Vienna was determined uh, to make peace because they knew that in case of the Spanish king's death, France could easily win the war for Spanish succession if the Turkish war was not brought to an end. Before opening the peace conference, the Holy See compiled a memorandum uh, to the emperor to guarantee the interests of the Catholic Church. It urged that all Catholic parallels be allowed to continue in their seat or travel freely in case of disposition in the Ottoman Empire. The memorandum demanded that all Catholic churches should be maintained and those that had been destroyed should be rebuilt. The Holy See underlined the necessity to restore the Franciscan monastery in Kiprovci, Bulgaria, which had been a center for Roman Catholics in the region until their anti-Ottoman uprising in 1688. The third point stressed that uh, Ottoman leaders should not allow any violent act against the Catholic community. They urged for a new hospital and church for the German Trinitarian fathers in Constantinople. To the task of these Trinitarian fathers would have been to free Christian slaves from Ottoman slavery. They also demanded that the church, the Holy Sepulcher in Jerusalem, should be left in the hands of the Franciscans and no pilgrims should be hindered from visiting. 
The next two points requested that, Christ that Christians should be allowed to be buried by their own priests and that monks should be free to travel uh, to their superiors in the territories under Ottoman rule. Finally, the Holy See asked the Sultan to keep good deal with the Christians of his empire. The Nuncio was of the opinion that, the, that to guarantee the status of the Catholics, it would, it would be necessary to reestablish the position of Ignatius uh, Peter VI, the patriarch of the Syriac Catholic Church. The patriarch would have been uh, the highest ecclesiastical representative of the Catholics in the Ottoman Empire, and he also accepted the supremacy of the Pope. The peace treaty was signed on the 26th of January, 1699. Religious matters were discussed in the 13th article, which in general followed the guidelines of the Holy See. But the text also emphasized that in the future, the representation of religious matters to the sublime court would uh, be the task of the imperial ambassador to Constantinople. It left, it left open the question of further guarantees regarding the status of Catholic Church in the Ottoman Empire. Nevertheless, the Cardinal Secretary expressed his satisf satisfaction with the treaty and ordered the new seal to communicate the Pope's approval to the Imperial Court. The three prelates, Cardinal Kolonic, the Bishop of Solsona, and Nuncio Santa Croce formed a kind of alliance in, in the Viennese court. Although the interests of their respective courts often clashed with each other because of European politics, they, they were able to work together more or less in the interests of the Catholic Church. At the same time, they were politically astute in seeing the problems arising from the unresolved Spanish succession and its influence on Vienna's policy in the Adriatic. The fateful breakup of their alliance took place in 1700. Sosuna was ordered back to Spain, Santa Cruz was made a cardinal and left for Rome. Pope Innocent III died in September the same year, King Charles II of Spain died in November, and Sosuna died in December. Europe was soon back on the war path, and the war of the Spanish succession completely reshaped the balance of power in Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bella. Um, so our next uh, and final speaker for today, uh, Ms. Niksha Varezic of the University of, of Splits uh, Faculty of Philosophy and his work explores early modern diplomacy focusing uh, in particular uh, on the Mediterranean, Mediterranean history and the Mediterranean and uh, uh, the relationship between, especially between the Papal, uh, papal Curia and, and the Croatian early modern uh, regions. So, um, his Nishna Marezic's talk, the title is uh, Buon ragione di Stato, la politica divina e umana non deve permettere né comportare. The relations between the church and the state uh, on the example of the violation of church immunity in Dubrovnik in 1662. So, Nishna, please.
systems. Uh, uh, my uh, report uh, rather follows uh, the discussion of uh, Emir Filipovic because as he told us something about the Brown diplomatic experience with uh, its Balkan hinterland. Uh, my uh, paper uh, is about case from this Ponenti diplomatic experience. Anyway, uh, in the context of uh, the Bromnik history of 17th century, uh, the aim of finding an adequate reduction, the Bromnik Senate most commonly turned to paper Rome. I would not go into discussion on the mutual benefits that supported such dynamics and quality of these relations, but precisely uh, those benefits were the core from which the ultimate outcome of all diplomatic initiatives arose, and that outcome was uh, the realization of political patronage and material support, uh, which Rome gave to Rome during many episodes of that truly dramatic 17th century. However, it would be wrong to think uh, that everything went easily on the Roman Roman relations. In addition, uh, to find diplomatic skills, it was necessary to have enough persistence uh, and patience in order to obtain the required paper grace. Uh, in effort uh, to ensure an optimal outcome, the Republic followed some kind of diplomatic uh, postulate and that was always maintain the practice of uh, sending letters to Rome, sempre tenere viva la pratica di scrivere a Roma. Uh, precisely this practice, uh, this postulate, which uh, I imposed, which imposed that it should never be missed an opportunity to communicate with Rome, I tried to confirm with uh, some examples during my presentation a month ago at the National Congress of Croatian Historians. Okay. Should I wait for... That's a... Oh. Yeah, that's, that's... So uh, precisely this practice, this postulate which I imposed, which imposed that uh, it should never be missed an opportunity to communicate with Rome, I tried to confirm with my uh, uh, presentation a month ago that I uh, had on at uh, the National Congress of Croatian Historians. I wanted to emphasize that uh, this postulate uh, manifested itself not only in those extraordinary uh, truly crisis situation, which required an urgent favorable response from the Pope, but also in all regular <laughs> protocol circumstances of papal Rome. For example, at the beginning of each new pontificate, when relatives of the new pontiff arrived at the papal court, the Brownic Republic congratulated uh, all these members of the papal family for their uncle or brother being chosen for this prestigious position, or to some individuals among them for taking soon uh, an important position in leading, in leading the church state. So uh, these were the selected individuals who were in the most direct contact with the newly elected pontiff and their sympathies the Brownic Senate tried to win. They, are, uh, they were the ones uh, who were in position to push, to promote, or in any way intervene in the things that concerned the Bronic until its final realization. Uh, protocol occasions uh, are especially worthy for the senders as they do not require much engagement of the addressee, except the confirmation of receiving a courtois gesture. Such protocol occasions serve to form uh, a, a, a list of intimate contacts. So one month ago, I had the opportunity to cite such examples related to the accession of Alexander VII to the papal throne, following the correspondence with the members of Kiji family who came to the papal court at that occasion. 
I concluded with the thought that this courtois baroque rhetoric never remained only on the on that formal level, because such a creative relationship would very soon, at the first next occasion, seek and result in much more concrete engagements of the Pope and members of the Roman court. And such a serious engagement uh, of the same members of the Kiji family in mediating towards Alexander the Seventh uh, for the interest of the growing government, I will present uh, now on the example of one event that occurred. Uh, uh, something. And this is not uh, this presentation does not follow my report. Uh, no, no, no. So uh, this uh, case study, uh, this event uh, that occurred during the 1662, the case was uh, conducted at the Roman Curia still during the 1663, when after a relatively short period, it was finally concluded. So uh, in the summer of 1662, uh, the Brovnik nobleman Marino di Caboga, uh, in a dispute, fatally wounded a prominent nobleman and member of the Brovnik Senate, Nicola uh, di Soro. This murder uh, dragged the Republic into a class and political crisis. The killer hid in a Franciscan man monastery in the Brovnik, hoping for a church asylum, which was almost severely injured by the secular authorities in accordance with the decision of the Bronic Senate to catch the offender and transfer him to a state prison. Uh, the Archbishop of Dubrovnik strongly protested against the violation of the church asylum, demanding that Kaboga must be transferred to the church prison. And in that sense, he appealed to the courier authorities. The Bronic Senate uh, sent to Rome a special envoy, Nicola di Gondola, who was to convince the Curia as well as the Pope himself uh, of the correctness of the arguments of the Brunic Sand. Uh, research on this theme uh, till now was based uh, primarily on correspondence with uh, this collection. So uh, Emir had uh, this opportunity to uh, show us his search based upon the Lettere Commissiones di Levante and my uh, case is uh, Lettere Commissiones di Pone also very extraordinary uh, archive collection. Uh, so uh, what were the challenges uh, they met and the methods the Bronixen used in this diplomatic mission? First of all, uh, it should be mentioned that in its rich experience with Roman Curia, the Bronix government was often unsatisfied with, that, with the dynamic, dynamics that Roman Curia was dealing with emergencies or as it is widely uh, stated, le lunghezze ordinarie della corte romana ci fanno l'angolie tra le speranze di qualche soccorso, or the usual slowness of the papal court make us weak, hoping for some help. Uh, during the uh, Dronic Senate always tried to reduce this lunghezza ordinaria della corte romana, because during the post-Tridentine period, 
the Roman Curia represented a really truly large bureaucratic apparatus whose jurisdiction was spread to several continents at the time. On this occasion, the Dronic Senate uh, certainly wanted to avoid resolving this case with the Congregation of Immunity, aware that it would, be, it would mean a long procedure with uncertain outcome. Post students in Rome tried at every opportunity to persistently defend ecclesiastical immunity, especially since there were institutional mechanisms. Uh, Dubrovnik Senate uh, claimed that they were that they respected the dignity of the church in this case, and that in the absence of the archbishop at the time, they first informed the archbishop's vicar before dragging Kaboga out of the monastery. The government demanded uh, the matter to be resolved directly by appealing to the Pope, not through the usual courier procedure at the congregation. Uh, was, as it was said, che cognizione di simile causa si levi della detta congregazione, it's not seen, uh, e per grazia sua si conosca da sua beatitudine con la sua plenipotente autorità. Or, uh, non crediamo, uh, ne, non deve altrimenti farsi nella solita forma della Chiesa, ma con breve particolare diretto a noi. As the Dubrovnik Republic already had the similar case with Paul III from 1536, when the Republic pulled a murderer out of the church space, and another papal breve from 1538 mentions mm -hmm the official forbiddance of providing shelter in churches to the most serious delegates. Uh, but the sending of the papal breve in Dubrovnik will not be possible immediately. Uh, it will be prolonged, uh, postponed, due to the intervention of a certain Monsignor Bernardo Rocchi, who was the secretary of the Congregation of Immunity. Through congregation, Dubrovnik Archbishop actually wanted to keep Kaboga in a church prison, which was denied by the secular authorities, claiming that church prison could not meet the security requirements. Beside the Archbishop's initiative, uh, it is possible that this case was also instrumentalized by certain aristocratic family clans close to Kaboga. However, uh, the Dubrovnik Senate referred to a message received from a certain cleric uh, to whom the Archbishop's procurator uh, in Rome had written and reported that he had been informed by a person who had arrived from Dubrovnik about some details concerning this case, which the Dubrovnik Senate tried to keep in a strict secrecy. So Gondola was in charge to find out everything about it, who that person could be. In Vigilate, per sapere chi fa costi per parte del detto Caboga, o pubblicamente o privatamente, e di ogni cosa minutamente avvisate, scrivendo le lettere di proprio pugno, e non di mano di altri, e particolarmente cose secrete. So the government was extremely suspicious and very, and very, very cautious. Uh, on a few more occasions, the Brony government will ask its agent in Rome about those people who talk about this secret case around the Rome. Chi sono quelli che per tutti i cantoni parlano del detto negozio? Wondering who could be beside the procurator and the priest for the dimension of the Brony Archbishop as well as the Venetian ambassador in Rome, whom Gondola asked to cooperate in the interest of the Bronic Senate. This was obviously uh, an initiative beyond the knowledge and control of the Bronic government, which created additional tension and called for extreme caution and vigilance, because in any case, such an initiative should have been prevented. And therefore, Gondola had to inform the Senate about everything con avvisarne del tutto puntualissimamente per nostro governo, 
stando sempre oculato ad osservare per parteciparne se in avvenire ciò si intentasse da alcuno e da chi. I hope you understood mostly. Uh, so means and methods applied by the Browning government during this diplomatic mission, uh, on one hand, follows the usual protocol, which assumes the sequence of instructions of the Browning government. However, as each situation is specific, including this one, the agent, the agent in Rome, Gondola, is also left free to think and act independently in the given circumstances with one condition. Uh, B. Yes, okay. okay. Di ragguagliarci di settimana in settimana di ciò che giornalmente vi fosse occorso in Novato. To inform us from week to week about the news and what happened on a daily basis. And then, in ordine al intenzione uh, e volontà di questo Senato, indrizzarete tutti i nostri negoziati. Uh, in accordance with the general instructions of the Browning government, you need to direct all our negotiators in accordance with orders and wish of this Senate. Uh, senza metterli in contesa, aiutandoli. This is very interesting instruction uh, because the Browning Senate was aware of the delicacy of the mission. Agent was told to present the whole thing so that the Curia high officials Engaging, engaging in this uh, case, do not come into conflict of interests themselves. Uh, con tutti quali modi e mezzi che giudicarete a questo proporzionati, the agent is given, obviously, the freedom to plan the mission independently in the given circumstances and to trace it to the person who can be helpful. Uh, <coughs> Esagerando il detto eccesso commesso dal detto Caboga e la necessità che ci ha indotto alla detta estrazione. This was a very common tactic of the Romanic Republic in diplomatic uh, discourse uh, because uh, the Romanic uh, didn't act from a stronger position, but on the contrary, to emphasize its own weakness so that any danger to the Romanic uh, presented as extremely dangerous. So the addressee was asked for a prompt reaction. Uh, it is also interesting uh, to note one detail in this government's instructions uh, regarding gaining the assistance of courier officials in favor of the Romic interest. Uh, this one, pregandolo che vi indirizzi e cooperi con la sua destrità e avvedutezza in così urgentissimo e tipotissimo affare, assicurandolo che perciò questa Repubblica procurerà di gratificarsi. They allude here to uncommon practice in relation to opponent, unlike that to the lament. Uh, and that was given, giving the gifts to meritorious individuals. For example, some cardinals, a golden sink or golden jug worth 100 scudas, while meritorious agents would be rewarded with a certain amount of money. And for the public reputation, it uh, was proposed to use a carriage and a rented house how can we see this uh, site? Uh, 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 it is said, uh, la quale carrozza vi si commette che dobbiate di continuo tempo e la casa ad affitto. And it was very important to, to uh, 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 it was very important to follow all these ceremonial customs that the Bronic agents follow by the example of the representative of all other rulers practiced by their presence at the papal court. So with this, with this example, we refer to that historiographical phrase, 
Roma Papale come Teatro della Politica Europea. In the same context, it is also interesting to remark, uh, to, to notice the remark of the growing government who accused at one moment its agent Gondola of failing to realize a new audience with the Pope during four months. And also noticing that uh, dovevate non solo per urgenza del detto negozio, ma anche per la pubblica reputazione, perché come apparisce a noi strano, assai più apparirà a cotesta corte. It would be strange that someone's representative is so incapable to get audience to Pope. In addition, uh, let's just specify specify who were the, these respectable and relevant, relevant individuals, intermediaries, to whom the Brownic Republic addressed in order to adequately advise its agent, but also to lobby uh, with the Pope, Alexander VII, in accordance with the interests of the Brownic Senate. These were certainly Cardinal Matthew, Flavio Tigi, Don Mario Tigi, uh, the Pope's elder brother, and also the general of the Santa Chiesa, as well as the Dubrovnik Cardinal Protector Francesco Barberini, who still enjoyed uh, an exceptional reputation in the Curia. And uh, one of the reasons was, that the, was the fact that many Curia officials were appointed precisely by his uncle Urban VIII Barberini. And one of them already mentioned secretary of the Congregazione, Bernardo Rocchi, also became the secretary of this congregation during the pontificate of Urban VIII. So uh, due to these great merits of the Cardinal's uncle, the Dubrovnik Cardinal Protector could have a certain influence with Rocchi. Uh, in one letter, the government pointed out that regardless of the intentions of the congregation, it is expected uh, a positive outcome as tutti i grandi, i principali soggetti di Catesta Corte sono a noi favorevoli, favorevoli e ben disposti. Uh, a certain Domenico Salvetti was also involved, I assume a citizen of Dubrovnik uh, with a certain position in Rome, il quale per il passato sempre si è dimostrato molto a futuro un torizio e tavano vediamo che anche in questo ancora non mancherà di fare lo stesso uh, this Domenico Salvetti actually was mentioned earlier in 1645 when he lobbied with the curial officials for financial assistance in the procurement of weapons which Rome granted to the Romic with the uh, outbreak of Candian War because of that successful achievement in that commission, uh, the government have rewarded him with the golden sink and a jug worth a hundred of scudas. Very interesting is his governmental, governmental letter stating uh, to his agent that è stata prudente la vostra risoluzione di insinuarci nella grazia di Monsignor Nini, maestro di camera e segretario di sua beatitudine, come ci dite, tanto favorito per disponer col mezzo suo l'animo del pontefice e renderlo propenso a nostro favore. After uh, Gondola initially presented his method to the Pope, the Bromic Senate hoped to receive minuta, a sketch of this much wanted breve, precisely from this Nini, uh, which should first be sent uh, to the Bromic to be inspected by the Senate. When the Dubrovnik government uh, directly addressed the Pope, uh, arguments were uh, uh, in order to gain, uh, to present uh, uh, to the Alexander VII, uh, making him to understand uh, uh, these arguments as he was a secular ruler also, or come principe spirituale in tutta la cristianità e temporale nei suoi stati avrebbe con sua somma prudenza trovato modo di condescendere a nostre giuste soddisfazioni. Moreover, uh, the murder committed against a prominent senator in the rector's palace was considered as a first-class crime. 
mediante il quale è stata lesa questa Repubblica nella sua libertà e maestà, by which, by which, uh, by that murder, this Republic was harmed in its freedom and majesty. After the first audience, uh, which according to Gondola turned out to be successful, due to papal oral guarantee to Dubrovnik, uh, trovata la santità di Nostra Signore dispoti, dispotissima, dispostissima, e tamendo la medesima vive voci su oracolo, comandato che si, spide, si, che si spedisce il breve a favor nostro, uh, further correspondence between the Senate and Gondola reveals that the petition of Monsignor Rocchi somewhat changed the original papal move, prolonging the sending of the breath. After Gondola finally managed to get a second audience in May of 1663, uh, the Dubrovnik government refers to modified and somewhat more reserved papal attitude with words vedendo di esservi portato ai piedi di sua beatitudine a capo di tanti mesi e averla in quella conosciuto alterata la sua ottima disposizione da quella che nella prima audienza vi dimostrò. The Pope must now be convinced that he is judging as a temporal ruler also uh, with his ragion di Stato as well as the Bromic Senate. Uh, bearing in mind how politica divina e humana certa di dover, dover essere consolata da, sua, da, da sua beatitudine. Divine and human politics certain of having to be reconciled by his beatitude. So the final outcome, uh, this was not the case uh, when church immunity was violated in a way that secular authorities penalized clergy. Such an act was perceived by Rome as a complete disrespect of ecclesiastical jurisdiction in that segment. So this case was resolved relatively quickly for the average query procedure, and the Pope ultimately had to act in a compromising way, but not entirely in line with Dubrovnik's expectations. Although he left the accused Dubrovnik nobleman to the secular justice, a special clause specification uh, Citra Poena Sanguinis was placed, ordering that Kaboga must be spared from the death penalty. The Brony government was not satisfied because it was not consulted in making the final decision. It is interesting how this time the decision was accepted without much discussion. Such an outcome was explained, what is was, uh, especially interesting, by a lack of luck this time. Non possiamo che attribuire simile pregiudizio alla poca fortuna degli stessi. This was not the exactly typical Dubrovnik's diplomatic practice because the Dubrovnik Senate did not hesitate to border, to annoy as much as possible, insisting on its principles. Apparently this time uh, the government was impressed by the message of Gondola from Rome, who noticed that it was not possible to get more than that at the moment non potendone manteggiare più oltre come scrivete e per non dare tempo al tempo di nuove alterazioni, vi si commette che riceviate il proposto di breve. The Senate agreed that there was no point in persisting any longer and that the current text of breve should be taken before possible new changes, as that one still confirmed secular jurisdiction. In the end, uh, although indignant, the Bronic Senate expressed a in a survey tone that it accepted such a paper decision by words, eh, nel ringraziare per esso, per esso breve, a sua santità et altri, dite con buona maniera, di averlo ricevuto perché così ha voluto e comandato sua, sua beatitudine. Ma per non essere affatto libero, restano perturbati gli animi di tutti noi, eccetera, eccetera. Uh, in, for conclusion, uh, this discussed case shows really complex relations of secular and ecclesiastical authorities, which is always an actual topic. And on the other hand, it shows how much the Roman Curia was a really a large bureaucratic apparatus with various authorities. The secular authorities of the church state were often associated 
within those curial ones, which carried different competencies of governing the Catholic Church. And this especially refers to the institution of the Roman Pontiff, where even through this particular case, of the Dubrovnik Republic evokes this famous phrase of Paolo Prodi, il sovrano pontefice in corpo e due anni. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is it for today. Uh, we are done with our final panel for today. We uh, resume tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Um, uh, with, uh, with our fifth panel, a time for war and a time for peace, a time to be free. Uh, so yes, uh, I would like to invite everybody now who signed up for dinner to join us and we will uh, have dinner. And thank you to all, uh, thank you for the audience. Uh, thank you to all the members of the audience and to all, the, all those following us on uh, Zoom. So see you tomorrow. Thank you.